Okay, so uh, welcome everyone to the session for the Executive Diploma and Financial Strategy uh, here at the University of Oxford, Said Business School. Uh, my name is Sarah Nima. I am the Recruitment Manager for the programme. Uh, and today I am uh, joined by a uh, programme faculty member, Dr. Tim Galpin, who will be discussing uh, M&A and joint ventures, emerging markets and maximising value, followed by Q&A. During the sample lecture, uh, please post your questions using the chat function. Uh, we will answer them uh, after the lecture. But uh, before that, I will kick off with some uh, key and quick facts on, on this diploma. So the Executive Diploma in Financial Strategy is a specialized postgraduate qualification uh, awarded by the University of Oxford. Uh, we have designed it uh, to be in a deliberately accessible format uh, by making it part-time over 12 months so that students can remain and work and apply lessons learned in practice. In terms of design, it is structured around four modules or four to five days each. Uh, three modules will be assessed by online open book exams and one module uh, will be assessed by uh, 6,000 words integra final integrative assignment. This year's intake will start on Wednesday, uh, 26th of January 2022, and the fee is around £27,500. This fee uh, includes tuition and uh, most of learning resources. The diploma is built on four core modules uh, that are completed individu individually uh, within one year with, uh, as I said, an, integ an integrative uh, assignment at the end. Uh, each module uh, begins on, on a Tuesday or Wednesday and concludes on Saturday afternoon, uh, allowing students to combine work and study. Uh, in between modules, uh, there are post and uh, pre and post readings, uh, but mainly exam or assignment preparation. Students must pass all four modules, the exams and the assignment uh, to be awarded the diploma qualification. The students who pass are awarded the diploma are offered the opportunity to receive their qualification at a traditional University of Oxford ceremony. The elements uh, you can see on screen here, the elements included in each of the modules, they are uh, outlined uh, in summary here. Uh, this content is all strategic and these concepts will be discussed from a, a senior strategic point of view. Uh, it is a very equipping and, and specialized qualification, as you will see from the sample lecture today, uh, and it is designed for senior finance professionals and senior managers. It provides them with a distinct and intellectual edge combined with a, a practical understanding of business and value creation to enhance their career prospects. Uh, just to recap quickly on, on the assessment uh, elements uh, of, of this program, the, the diploma is formally assessed by three individual exams and a written assignment of 6,000 words. Students have about three months uh, to, to complete or write this assess uh, assignment. Uh, and in terms of time commitment, uh, we give a rough guideline of six to eight hours uh, study time per week for the duration of, of the diploma, which is 12 months. The last intake uh, started with 35 students uh, and the rest of the numbers is, is what we uh, typically have on this diploma classes. For example, the average age is, uh, is 39 and students have an average of 15 to 16 uh, years of work experience. And you can see that participants are senior knowledgeable practitioners who come from a rich mix of industries, uh, backgrounds uh, and, and experiences. Okay, so uh, now I will hand you over to uh, the program faculty member, uh, Dr. Tim Galpin. Uh, if you have any questions, then please post them in the chat function, uh, and we will address as many as we can uh, during the, the during this session. Tim, over to you. I'll go ahead and share my screen. Um, somebody actually typed in the Q and A. Um, is the event going to be recorded and shared with us? Uh, Sarah, you want to go ahead? And yes, sure. Yeah, the, uh, this session is recorded and uh, the link will be sent out uh, just a couple of days uh, after. Okay, I'm going to resize so everybody can see this. So, um, uh, looks like 
Uh, you should be able to see this. Sarah, can you verify that? Uh, it, yes. Okay, so I will be monitoring the chat function. So I'm gonna use the chat function as a way to um, address questions. So if you have any questions, uh, I'm also going to ask you to type some responses to questions that I have uh, into the chat function as I go through uh, some of the slides uh, that I'll walk you through. So <clears throat> I wanna address this topic um, for about 45 minutes and then leave some time at the end for uh, general Q and A um, about the program. <clears throat> so um, I'm not gonna take the entire time of the session uh, just on the topic of m a in emerging markets. So <clears throat> um, here's some of the objectives I wanna cover over the next uh, 45 minutes. Uh, current m a trends in emerging markets, a uh, bit of data on that. Um, key challenges of m a across the entire process. So at Oxford, uh, our m a course uh, and topics are taught uh, not just as a valuation course, which a lot of business schools teach M&A, mainly as a pre-deal, often as a, essentially a valuation course. Um, that is a piece of our course, but not all of it. So we look at M&A through the entire process from strategy, uh, targeting, um, valuation, negotiation, close, and then post-deal integration and measurement. So you'll see a model of that in a few minutes. Um, what does M&A success look like? We've heard a lot of horror stories over the years about M&As that go wrong. Um, and I'll touch a bit on that, but also show you what M&A success looks like. And then how do you manage M&A across the process to create maximum value, whether you're doing a domestic deal or across border uh, in emerging markets or, or even other markets. So a lot of very transferable um, aspects of M&A. Uh, <clears throat> so, um, it looks like there's a hand up. Um, go ahead and type your question in um, because I see an electronic hand in the air. Uh, go ahead and type it into chat um, and then I'll go ahead and address whatever question you have and I'll address as many as you have. So um, let me go ahead and uh, give you a bit of background why I teach in the program, why I'm at Oxford. I've been here uh, five years now. Um, I got into m and to bridge the gap between deal makers and those who make deals work. And so when I talk about deal makers, bankers, typically um, strategy groups, uh, either internally and uh, strategy advisors, the big strat houses like uh, Bain, McKinsey, uh, Booz, where I used to work, which is now part of PwC, um, LEK, BCG, AT Kearney, et cetera. Um, and then the people that make deals work. And now you know, M&A integration has become an industry. Um, but when I first started in it, it wasn't. Uh, so I do have a PhD um, that I did straight through undergrad master's PhD, went into Hughes Aircraft as a project manager initially, um, because I didn't want to just go straight into academia. Um, from there, I started a consulting business in London uh, with a couple of uh, friends of mine. And then we grew that, got uh, acquired by Arthur Anderson. Um, and then I lived in Germany with them for a year. I uh, liked working in Germany, but I didn't like Arthur Anderson, which came to pass when they blew up that firm a uh, number of years after I left with the Enron debacle. Uh, so I um, went to Booz Allen, did strategy for a couple of years, and then I moved um, over to Watson White Worldwide and became their head of uh, M&A services globally. I had 90 offices in 30 countries and we were growing that business on a global basis uh, as a big M&A wave. Uh, and those of you that have done deals before, uh, you know M&As come in waves. Um, we had a wave that ended, um, about a 10-year wave that ended because of COVID, beginning of 2020, uh, deal volume shut down. And then the second half of 2020, things started to pick up. And uh, now in 2021, we have record volume, and I'll show you a bit of data on that. Um, then I started my own business again, uh, mainly focused on M&A strategy, due diligence and integration, sold it to a group in Chicago um, in 2005, which freed me up to do this as my retirement career. So um, this is my second career. Uh, it's my retirement gig. And uh, the reason this slide's called Half-Life is because an old book talks about spend the first half of your life trying to make money, second half trying to make a difference. And that's my career to a T. Um, so this is my give back time. 
of my career, and I've written five books. Uh, these two are my M&A books. Uh, I've written two books on strategy uh, as well. Uh, and uh, the book with the blue banner, The Complete Guide to M&A, that's been a bestseller since uh, 1999 when it first came out, since its third edition now. Um, the winning at the acquisition game, the one on the left here, uh, just came out through Oxford University Press last year, and it does cover the entire spectrum of M&A, more from an overview perspective, not necessarily a deep dive, and you'll see the model and spectrum of that uh, in a few minutes. So what are some current M&A trends uh, in emerging markets? Uh, here's a bit of data. I mentioned that deal volumes back up again. It looks like we've started another M&A wave. We'll see how long it lasts. As I mentioned, the 10-year uh, wave after the crash of 08-09 uh, ended beginning of 020 because of COVID. Um, we've seen a surge of deal volume end of 020 and into uh, 2021. Uh, you can see it's up 282%, at least this was first half of 21. Uh, in North America, 95% in EMEA, and then over 100% uh, percent in the rest of the world. So on a global basis, uh, these are stats from merger market. You can you know, pull uh, data from various sources on M&A. Some of it's free, some of it's for fee. Uh, merger market's one of the good sites to go to. Um, DealLogic, PitchBook, um, IMAA, there are several different uh, databases, um, again, that uh, have a lot of free data available. So you can see the deal volume scattered around the globe. Uh, and this is up through the uh, Q1 of 2021 um, was the latest data that Merger Market had available um, that I looked for recently. And the biggest uh, sector was technology. And people always ask, you know, the percentages, are they where deals are being, um, where the acquisition is occurring or where the outbound uh, it's from the outbound where the acquirer is based. So they'll, uh, so about 55% uh, in North America, you can see about 25% in Europe and then uh, scattered around. And again, the biggest sector is technology uh, so far. Um, so let me give you an exercise. Let me uh, ask you to start typing into chat and answer some questions. Um, this is the first question I have for you because, uh, you know, the way we run our courses is not just a straight lecture. Some of you might be used to that from your undergraduate and or master's, even PhDs that some of you may have. Um, and that's not the way we typically run our courses. Um, we like interaction, discussion. You'll learn as much from your cohort. Um, you're going to have people from uh, various regions around the world uh, in your cohort should you join the program. Um, you're going to have people from various industries, various functions, from startups, medium-sized companies, large corporations, not-for-profits, um, government. Um, we have uh, very diverse cohorts um, at all levels, typically um, from mid-management up through director, VP, and then C-suite. Um, so it's a really good environment to learn. So yeah, let's start typing in. Thank you for that, uh, Rajib. Uh, the political landscape. So what are some of the considerations for doing M&A in emerging markets that makes them different from developed markets? So Rajib has broken the ice. Go ahead and start typing in what you might think would be differences between uh, some of the key considerations if you're going uh, to do acquisitions. Uh, and it can be, you know, we use the term M&A, joint ventures, alliances, uh, all fall under the umbrella, um, either equity or non-equity alliances. Uh, all, as well as full acquisition. So uh, there's got to be more than Rajib. If you're going to participate at Oxford, uh, you're not just going to be able to sit in your seat. So thank you, Nico. Political and agendas and target jurisdictions, absolutely. Um, kind of echoing the political landscape. Um, what else might you think? So yes, there's what we call non-market strategy uh, is everything outside of the industry, competitors, um, new entrants, those sorts of things. Um, it's really uh, the non-market. It's all about um, typically government uh, policies, uh, rules and regs, uh, regulators, that sort of thing. Now they're starting flowing. Cheryl says infrastructure and availability of professional intermediaries. Absolutely. It may be very thin depending on which region you're in. Uh, ease of doing business, governance, ethical issues. Absolutely. Legal framework. So yes, rule of law. Um, 
uh, property rights uh, valuation, um, you may have a little reference for um, your various valuation techniques, uh, your um, comparable transactions, your multiples, um, your uh, LBO, and then the one that everybody does is discounted cash flow uh, and multiple versions of those. So um, yes, uh, Prashant is very familiar with it looks like the strategy frameworks, the basic ones uh, around past your political, economics, social, technological, legal, and environmental skills available. Thank you, Nico. Um, regulatory quality. Okay, good. So these are all key considerations uh, in a lot of jurisdictions and very much so when you uh, start looking at emerging markets. So um, here's just a few that kind of summarizes what a lot of you've typed in. Thanks for doing that. Uh, and participating. That's highly expected of you uh, in our programs. And our proportion of family owned and government owned entities, we, uh, there's several of you typed in political environment. Um, a lot of times government owns uh, some of these entities that you may be looking at taking a stake in. Um, high proportion of family owned uh, private entities, partnerships and JVs are often required. Um, so you you may be able to do full acquisitions depending on the jurisdiction. Other jurisdictions require you to have a local partner. So you're not doing actually the acquisition of the entire entity. Um, government stability was mentioned in the chat. Um, financial and reporting and transparency was mentioned. Um, and then again, this what we call non-market strategy, the government influence review and uh, connections often come into play. So uh, good, thank you for that. Um, there is a question uh, in Q&A. Um, Sebastian typed into Q&A. Um, now I got to monitor both Q&A and chat. Let's all use the chat if we can. That way I can just monitor one. Valuation is a little reference on no risk. Yes, thank you for that, uh, Sebastian. Absolutely, that reference point may be lacking. Uh, so key challenges across the process. I mentioned <clears throat> that we teach our M&A um, and um, courses uh, across the entire process, not just the pre-deal, front end, bit of due diligence, lot on valuation. We do have a valuation course that is module three. Um, it touches heavily on valuation, um, both public and private uh, entities. Um, so this is a deal flow model that <clears throat> I've used for years with my clients. Um, when I was consulting, I still do consulting uh, part-time. I don't do it full-time like I used to because my full-time job now is as a faculty member here at Oxford. Uh, so pre-deal, deal, and post-deal, three stages uh, or three phases with 10 stages. I uh, started out with six, went up to eight um, in the second edition of my book. Um, got up to 10 now. I think I'm done. Uh, so formulate your acquisition strategy. Um, why are you doing deals? Uh, there's an old phrase uh, in m and that m and is not a strategy. Uh, it's a way to execute your strategy as a strategic buyer. So if you're a private equity, um, then your strategy is m and You buy and sell companies as your business model. But uh, if you're a strategic buyer rather than a financial buyer like private equity, um, you're doing m and to execute a growth strategy, a consolidation strategy, enter new markets, acquire new products uh, and services to offer that sort of thing. So um, your uh, solid M&A strategy should be formulated right up front, um, locate targets that potentially fit that strategy or investigations or due diligence, trying to find out about those targets, financial, technological, operational, um, human capital, all kinds of different due diligences that can be done. Um, the deal side, you want to obviously do valuation, uh, the various valuation techniques that I mentioned, uh, negotiate. Uh, so prices, uh, valuation is calculated, but price is negotiated. So, and there's a lot of other things that you negotiate beyond price. You consummate, close the deal. You often have gap between signing of the actual uh, sales and purchase agreement or SPA as it's called and closing or completion, depending on which side of the ocean you're on. Uh, so um, you can do simultaneous uh, signing and closing if you're doing a private deal, but public typically you have a waiting period for regulatory approval, et cetera. Well, once the deal's closed, you have your post-deal activities uh, and you're looking at operational, technological, and people integration, um, motivation of the workforce, key talent, communication, 
uh, so key talent retention, especially if you're doing aqua hiring, as it's called, uh, you need you know, 100 coders that know a particular area that you're interested in, rather than hire 100 people, you go and buy a company that has that skill set you need. Um, so uh, culture, uh, big C word, um, is very important in deals. Uh, it's often why deals fall apart even before the deal closes or afterwards, um, you won't realize synergies often because of culture clashes. Innovate for revenue growth. Um, a lot of people focus their integration on cost reduction, overlapping headquarters, site locations, um, et cetera, operations. But there's also often revenue uh, increase built into your um, discounted cash flow. And so you need to look at both what cost synergies are you going to capture, as well as your upside revenue synergies. And that's typically around innovation. Uh, and then evaluate. A lot of companies overlook that last stage. Um, doing the post-mortem, as it's called, to look back and say, what did we do well on this deal? What could we have improved? And use that learning for future deals. This is a linear uh, model in its depiction, but those of us who've done deals know that uh, these stages overlap and loop back on each other. So for ease of illustration, it's linear, but um, you're often thinking and even planning your integration um, well before the deal closes, uh, for example. So during due diligence, um, even thinking about it during your um, M&A strategy. So, so there's key objectives for each of these stages. I'm not gonna read them all to you. Um, I'll provide Sarah with the slides and she can provide them to you. Um, I'm totally open source. I publish all my tools and templates in my books. Uh, and you know, it's one of those things that um, people can have the tools but they don't often use them correctly or, or well. Uh, because they have their own biases and make mistakes uh, because you're always going to learn on every deal. Uh, I have guest speakers in my m &A course uh, all the time from a uh, former uh, long-term McKinsey partner, Goldman Sachs partner, um, head of Deutsche Banks or former head of Deutsche Banks m &A, uh, global m and practice, um, a attorneys, uh, senior uh, legal advisors on m and et cetera, et cetera. Everybody says the same thing. They've all been in the M&A game for you know, 20, 25, 30 years. And we all say the same thing. We learn on every deal. Um, there's always something new that uh, pops up. So M&A is a lifelong learning opportunity. Um, you want your clear M&A strategy targets that fit all the stuff that I mentioned all the way through a measured and reported deal success during your evaluation. So Bit of survey results, uh, data shows it's difficult to achieve M&A success. So, uh, you know, if I go back to this slide, the main point here is, um, you know, M&A courses and uh, often M&A activity focuses on the pre-deal and deal stage, doing your due diligence, doing your evaluation, uh, negotiating, closing the deal, getting all the legal documentation filed, uh, all the valuation models, et cetera, et cetera. And then when the deal closes, the bankers leave, the attorneys typically are done with a little post-closing filings, that sort of thing. And then the uh, company needs to be um, run, uh, the combined entity, to capture the synergies that were projected. Uh, so pre-deal and deal are where values projected and agreed. Post-deal is where it's actually realized, um, but it's often an afterthought. So, you know, this idea that bankers get a deal success fee, and no offense to the bankers, but I don't think it should be called a success fee. Um, it should be uh, called a deal closing fee because deals are not successful until the synergies are actually achieved or exceeded. Uh, and the financial projections for the deal, strategic reasons for the deal are achieved so uh, or surpass. Um, so deal success isn't just deal close or completion. Deal success is did you achieve what you projected for that deal? So that's where post deal is the most important aspect. Uh, in my view and in experience. So if you look at these, um, I'm not gonna read them all to you. Um, like I said, Sarah will provide the slides, uh, the sources if you wanna dive in, <coughs> excuse me, are cited on the bottom of each slide uh, where there's some data. Um, but you know, first bullets, typical uh, analysis of 2,500 deals uh, found that more than 60% destroyed shareholder value on the acquiring side. So, um, uh, the last point here, almost half, this is from the survey that I do uh, each time I put out this from my uh, 2014 third edition of my 
first merger book, um, the respondents, uh, almost half, 49%, said they need a merger repair. So they close the deal, they work on their M&A integration, and then two or three years in, it's not working. Things are falling apart. Uh, key customers have left. Um, stock prices tanking. Key talent is leaving. Culture clashes. The operational integration isn't getting done or done well, and they need merger repair. So now you're in a triage situation. And I've brought been brought in a number of times by the board to say we need to clean this up uh, and help the senior team. Uh, even two or three years beyond the actual deal close, so merger repair. Uh, so this is something that, you know, these are all the statistics you see, but people do make money in deals. I mean, it gets done all the time, right? So um, there are some acquirers that make money. Um, typically it's the serial acquirers that repeat it on a, um, uh, over and over again. They have codified as well as tacit knowledge. So there's some best practices around that. Uh, meaning they have tools and templates, the codified piece and then tacit what's in people's heads experience in doing deals. And they can repeat it over and over. And they do more small deals, uh, easier to swallow. Um, so there are some co uh, common challenges that make these statistics uh, occur. Um, and by the way, when you're a seller, you typically make money because uh, the acquirer is going to pay not where your company's currently worth, but what it's worth in the future, hence uh, discounted future cash flow. And uh, the typical premium uh, is about 30, 31, 32% uh, on average, um, but it's often um, a lot higher these days. So um, there's a lot of money chasing fewer assets, lost supply and demand. Uh, and so assets are getting bid up. Uh, and so what are some of the common challenges that occur at these various stages, this you know, pre-deal, the deal, the post-deal, those 10 stages I just showed you um, that make M&As maybe challenging and even go off track. Go ahead and start typing into the chat again. Uh, cultural mismatch. Thank you, Mile. Only one. Come on. We need participation, please. <clears throat> Funding. Okay. Yes, absolutely. The costs can get out of control. Failure to track benefits, all right. Measurement and reporting along the brand preservation can be destroyed. Changes in deal structure, absolutely. Um, the way it's funded, et cetera. Um, is it gonna be a stock purchase? Are you, are you using stock as currency? Are you using uh, all cash, some combination? Is it a debt funded deal? Um, did the 25 also include PE M&A deals? Um, I, uh, I believe it was strategic advisor, uh, Purchasers, Rajiv, because there is some data that shows obviously PE um, has outperformed the market, although there's some data that will um, argue against that. Uh, actually, from one of our uh, faculty members, uh, uh, Ludovic uh, Filippo, uh, has gotten a lot of press in the last year or two um, about the data that he's collected on private equity. So, um, but like I said, once you get the slides, you could dive into that study and take a look. Um, adoption of changes, overhyped synergy expectations. Absolutely. Uh, you get a lot of hype behind these. You know, you're going to reduce costs by this and increase revenue by that. Um, you know, some realism is definitely uh, good to temper your expectations. Regulatory competition, authority approval, um, competition and auction sales. Yes, you can be the sole purchaser or uh, and or sole negotiate, uh, you have uh, sole negotiation with that one company, you might know them, um, single source uh, acquisition, or you may be in a bidding process often against competitors. Um, if a seller wants to make more money, they go into an auction process, typically run by uh, the bankers, sometimes the legal uh, firms will run it for them. Pending litigation, absolutely, that should all be identified during due diligence. Fear among employees, a lot of uh, fear comes up, and I'll get into that in a second. All right, good. So thank you for, again for your participation. Common M&A challenges, again, a summary of what you just typed in. Uh, sufficient and accurate pre-deal data for due diligence and valuation. Data is hard to come by, as we mentioned, often in emerging markets. Um, if you're buying a private company, if you're in an auction process, you'll have access to <clears throat> the data room during due diligence that everybody else has. 
access to, but um, it may not be, you know, the most complete information that you would like to have. Um, workforce concerns was typed in. So um, culture clashes, the main bullet at the bottom here, this uh, bold, uh, small deal failure can be more uh, absorbed more easily. Large deal failure, transformational deals uh, are much harder to swallow if you, uh, if they go wrong. Uh, so if you make mistakes with small deals, you can absorb, you know, uh, 10 million here, 50 million there, 100 million, whatever it might be. But, you know, if you're doing multi-billion dollar deals, doubling the size of your company, for example, I'm working with a company right now that's doubling the size of their company through a quote unquote merger, it's really an acquisition. Uh, and, you know, they've, uh, they were smart enough, the president, uh, CEO, were uh, smart enough to know what they didn't know. They run a good business on a day-to-day -day basis, but um, big transformational M&A, doubling the size of the company overnight uh, is different than running a good business. So even though they're smart, they run a good business in their industry, uh, they know what they don't know. So they wanted expert uh, guidance in what to do and what not to do. So best practices and avoiding the pitfalls and the process and the tools and how to apply it. And we're working towards close now with that process in place. So uh, if you're doing big deals, beware because they're very difficult to make work and they can crash your company. Bit of theory, you're gonna get a bit of theory, some research at Oxford. Uh, obviously I have a big practitioner background in my career. So I lean much more towards the practical um, tools, templates, uh, steps, processes, what you can apply today or tomorrow. Um, rather than a lot of theory. This is a good theory, though, that applies to M&A. It's called Bounded Rationality, Herbert Simon, uh, Nobel Prize winning economist back in the 50s, uh, came up with Bounded Rationality, has three elements, asymmetric information, time constraints, and cognitive limitations. So in deals, asymmetric and, uh, information, sometimes you've got way too much information, sometimes you don't have enough, uh, and that may fluctuate throughout even one deal, um, but from deal to deal. Time constraints, I've seen deals close in as little as a couple of weeks. I've seen them take upwards of a year or two or more to close, uh, depending on, you know, they are on, a, on again, off again, regulatory approval, et cetera. Cognitive limitations, this is the big one from a leadership perspective, no matter how smart you are, how great of a CFO or how great of a head of strategy or how great of a CEO you are, that's wonderful. And everybody's got the great degrees and experience. Um, Deals are hard to make work after you own the company. Again, the integration component, especially big transformational deals. And uh, it's a team sport. So M&A is a team sport. You do need the people around you uh, that know their role in the deals, uh, can add value, um, your bankers for the valuation, your attorneys for the legal elements, regulatory approval, filings, um, consultants to help out potentially on due diligence, um, tech integration, operational integration, human capital integration, specialists and actuaries and benefits, uh, big benefits programs are huge numbers on the balance sheet. If they're unfunded, you run into issues. So M&A is a team sport and you need to get your team around you. So uh, not any one person is going to make a deal work well. Uh, but, you know, a lot of people think they are the smartest person in the room. Back to the Enron uh, documentary that came out a number of years ago. Uh, and we saw what happened with that company. So knowing all this uh, challenge across the process, what you typed into the chat, um, knowing the deal, quote unquote, failure statistics, you know, 2,500 deals, 60% destroyed shareholder value, et cetera, et cetera. Um, why do firms pursue m and why, why do firms do it? Access to new markets, Rajib. Rajib's on fire. You're good at putting in the chat. So thanks for your participation. Who else? Other, uh, go ahead and type into chat. Why will firms do it? If it's a high risk activity, why do it? Faster growth? Absolutely, Nico. It's a shortcut to growth. m and is a shortcut to growth um, to enter the new markets. Other, CEO ego to expand the empire? Absolutely. Um, ego kicks in. Um, you end up paying too much. You end up buying companies you maybe not should, should not have. Um, you're in a bidding process. You know, the animal spirits kick in. Um, you want to outbid your competitors, that competition thing. Um, strategy isn't, you don't have the right M&A strategy. Uh, additional experience, the current firm does not absolutely um, acquire missing skill sets. Yes, the acquiring piece 
kill the competitor. Yes, there's actually a good article that came out a few years ago called Killer Acquisitions uh, or Killer Deals. I can't remember the exact title, but it was about in the pharmaceutical industry. Um, um, the data shows that big pharma will buy, uh, you know, startup uh, small uh, firms that have a potential blockbuster drug, but they'll buy them that would compete with theirs and they'll buy them before they reach the reporting threshold. So below a certain uh, monetary threshold, you do not have to report to the SEC in the US. Um, I think it's 93 million this year and above you do have to report. So they'll buy them just below that and then shut down that potential competition. In organic growth, yes, absolutely. Rather than organic growth, building it yourself takes a while. Um, so it's shortcut to growth. Uh, future monopoly, um, yes, the um, SEC is doing a review of uh, tech acquisitions in the US right now, going back 10 years, looking at whether they were um, you know, creating a monopoly. They've all passed through regulatory approval, but now they're doing a retroactive. Um, we'll see whether they take any action on those or not. Diversify your portfolio. You can do conglom build a conglomerate. GE did that. Tata's done it. Um, the Toon Group, uh, Siemens. These are all kind of poster children for. Um, but now you know conglomerates are out of favor. They're being dismantled. You see a lot of conglomerates in uh, emerging markets. Again, um, the capital markets aren't as well developed, so they become self-funding for new businesses, different types of businesses. Um, that form these conglomerates, the previous businesses they have um, fund the new businesses that they either start or acquire. So good. So here's just again, summary, why for firms pursue M&A, shortcut to growth. Several of you type that in to chat. Thank you again for your uh, participation. Um, deals are similar in the industries. You know, banks are buying banks, tech, tech firms are buying tech firms, et cetera. The 10 C's, uh, you know, when you write a book, you got to have the 10 C's or the 10 stages or all that sort of stuff. So channels, content, capabilities, customers, capacity, et cetera. Mandate, uh, synergy identification and successful execution. So not just identifying cost and revenue synergies, but capturing those. And the risk is eroding deal value through poor M&A approaches. So I'm going to show you how you make these things work, what success looks like. Uh, so, the, you know, some strategic acquirers, a lot of PE is successful, quote unquote, uh, you know, when they buy a company, uh, you know, and then sell it five, seven, 10 years later uh, for, you know, a higher multiple than what they currently purchased or what they previously purchased it for. That's the PE model. Um, and, you know, it's been generally successful over the years, uh, depending on the firm as well. Um, but strategic buyers also can be very successful. So here's a deal profile. Uh, run through it real quick. Two billion in sales. They acquired another um, a competitor. It was um, in the uh, manufacturing of pumps in the oil industry, big industrial pumps. Um, they acquired a competitor, seven seventy five million. So it was a big transformational deal. They promised Wall Street seventy five million in ongoing savings internally. They thought they could get about one hundred six million. Um, they were trying to obviously under promise, over deliver. Even if they only hit ninety million of their internal one hundred six million target they'd still surpass what they promised to the analysts. Um, they needed, it was a highly leveraged deal, so they financed it um, with considerable debt. Um, they needed a clear integration methodology, program or project management, and clear synergy measurement system. And here's uh, what occurred from an operational integration perspective. Um, it was a global deal. They had uh, eight service centers. They reorganized their sales force. Um, locations in North America, South America, the UK, and Europe. Um, the black line is their projection over an 18-month integration. The gray line is what we achieved, uh, and or the gray bars, and you can see that we accelerated the integration of most of the sites, uh, except for location seven in the US. And this is what uh, ended up happening um, with the synergy targets. So the blue line is the 75 million they promised to the analysts. The uh, 100%, the 142% red line is the 106 million internal target. The green line, the 174%, 131 million savings achieved, and we did it in nine months. So we did not slam the uh, organizations together. This is not about reckless speed. This is about prudent speed, good program management, um, 
you know, a weekly cadence of uh, different entities working uh, together, coordinating with each other for operational integration, technology integration, people integration, uh, site integration. We got 30 million right out of the gate in the quick hits, and we accelerated the synergy capture and we're done in about nine months rather than the projected 18 months, and we exceeded the targets. Uh, and the cash flow went way up. Uh, the CFO was very pleased about that because uh, she could use the excess cash flow <clears throat> to pay down the debt. And she ended up on the cover of CFO magazine uh, because of the uh, value that was being created from this deal. And uh, the article is called Making Deals Flow. The name of the company was FlowServe, uh, again, in the um, oil pump manufacturing industry. And uh, so she was very happy about that increased cash flow that occurred from the synergy capture acceleration. And this is what happened to the stock price over the next uh, couple of years after close. Um, so how do you manage M&A to create what you just saw from a success perspective? So let me walk you through real quick. Um, there's me issues. People worry about themselves. Senior management worry about it. Middle management employees. What do people worry about? Go ahead and type in real quick. What would you worry about when you hear about a deal? What, even if you're on the buy side or the sell side, what are you going to worry about? You're an executive, middle manager, frontline employee. What are you going to worry about? <clears throat> job security, absolutely, my job. Um, uncertainty of all kinds of things, sure. What are they going to be like to work for? What else are you worried about? Stock price, yes, change, stability. So my job, my pay, my benefits, all those sorts of things. Who will I report to? What culture do they have? Um, what will they be like? To, do I have to move? All that sort of thing. So um, creates an inward focus away from the customer. And here's how it plays out. Productivity on the vertical time across the horizontal. Announcement is the black line down the middle. Senior management's productivity drops first. They're distracted. They're working on the deal. Deals take a lot of time when you're working on them. Middle management, start learning about it. They hear rumors um, as do employees and then the official announcement. So middle management productivity drop lags and then employees. And so senior executives really need to manage uh, you know, from where the organization's view, not from their own view, because they're already the CFO, the CEO, uh, COO, head of HR, head of IT. They all know whether they're gonna get you know, one of those top jobs or not, or get the golden parachute to leave. So their me issues are answered early and you'll hear mistakes uh, made where, you know, they'll slow the decision process down. Um, they'll say things like, we don't need to communicate because we don't have anything to tell right now. So when you have a silence until you have answers to pay and benefits and roles and structure and all that locations, um, people will fill it with doom and gloom. So your middle management employees they are all, all worried. And uh, so you really got to manage this from the perspective of the middle management employees. Uh, here's a bit of data again. This is from a Deloitte survey uh, in 2019 of a thousand corporate and private equity executives. Um, they asked them several things. This is the question about most important factor in achieving successful m and transaction. Number one uh, response, effective integration. and you know, these are deal makers, you know, and not just the people who do integration. Uh, so, you know, people realize that the upfront planning and the negotiation and the closing, that's all just, you know, agreeing and projecting and agreeing value. The value is created in integration. Second was economic uncertainty. It's out of their control. Third, accurately valuing a target. We all know that valuation is a range, not a number. And you use multiple uh, valuation processes to get to that range, both on the buy side and the sell side. And, you know, you see where you may meet around price. Um, so let me walk you through real quick, just to wrap up. Uh, I won't talk you through all these. Again, the slides will be available to you, but just in the green box, you need a clear M&A strategy. An unclear strategy leads to poor M&A, typically. Locate targets, um, targets that fit the strategy. You want to look at um, you know, intentional M&A rather than opportunistic. Just because a company is available, it might not be a good fit, may not fit your M&A strategy. So be aware of that. Um, due diligence, investigate for no surprises or as few as you can hope uh, to uncover. Uh, 
so you prevent uh, surprises after deal close and conducting only traditional financial and operational technology due diligence that's good but often you need to look at human capital um, regulatory um, lawsuits etc cetera, etc cetera. so you got to really do as much uh, due diligence as is necessary to try to prevent those surprises. Valuation I've already mentioned. Um, realistic bid or negotiating range is what you're really trying to do with your valuation models. What are you going to pay? What are you going to sell for? Depending if you're on the buyer sell side. And uh, it's deal fever. Somebody typed that in earlier in one of the questions in the chat or one of the responses. Uh, CEO ego kicks in. Um, they end up, companies end up paying more than they should for a company because they get deal fever. Um, so beware of that. Negotiation, um, clearly defined deal terms, your objective. And if you're not prepared, uh, you get out negotiated. Uh, so always prepare for negotiation. And um, we dive into that in our M&A course as well. Closing deals, consummation, definitive purchase agreement or SPA, sales and purchase agreement. Um, mismanaging the period between signing and closing of the deal. Um, don't get regulatory approval, third-party approval, et cetera. Integration, this is where a lot of companies, you know, the deal makers are on to the next deal. Uh, they leave it to operations to, you know, integrate the newly acquired company. Uh, you delay the start and drag out the finish. It takes too long. Things start to fall apart. Accelerated integration is good integration, not reckless speed, prudent speed with good uh, data for decision-making. Motivation of the workforce, you want to look at communication, retention of key talent, and culture. And you got to execute those as well as you execute the operational and technology integration. Uh, if you do not do it, deals will fall apart, uh, even post-deal. Uh, additional revenue growth, um, that's your innovation piece, uh, focusing only on cost energy capture because it's the easiest to go after, easiest to measure. The revenue is a little bit harder to measure and harder to capture. Uh, and then evaluate your final stage, measure success along the way, report it, uh, adjust along the way. Um, are you hitting your milestones? Are you hitting your financial targets, your operational targets? And so not assessing deal success against the strategic intent of the deal is the mistake. And then the overall process, again, this codified tools, templates, steps, processes, as well as tacit knowledge uh, where people have m and experience, they know how to do it, they know where they fit in, um, they have the knowledge in their heads. And so no systematic approach to M&A gets people into trouble. Now you should be able to answer four key questions. That was a fire hose. Thank you for participating and uh, responding to the questions. This is how we will run our courses. Not necessarily as condensed as this. I can't make M&A professionals and experts out of all of you. Some of you already are because that's what you do for work. Uh, and so we saw some current trends. We're in another M&A wave. It's a boom time right now for M&A. Uh, key challenges of M&A, we've seen those. You typed them in uh, to the chat. Thank you. Uh, what success look like? We've looked at you know, a successful transaction, the increased uh, cash flows from accelerated synergy capture, and then how do you manage in the pitfalls and best practices? So one last question to go ahead and type into the chat from me to you. If you have one key takeaway from this 45 minute fire hose of uh, you know, what's M&A, uh, emerging market M&A, and then general M&A, obviously we've covered a lot of ground. Um, what's your one key takeaway if you had to pick one thing from this? Values created post deal, absolutely Nico. It's only agreed and projected pre-deal. Real values create, yes, thank you for that Prashant, echoing Nico, others? Keep them coming. Only thing standing between you and getting asked questions about the program. Of course, will probably be the most interesting. Thanks, Joanna. <laughs> uh, I, you know, I have to ask the participants. Uh, always be prepared. Plan, plan, plan. Uh, absolutely. Okay, good. So thank you uh, for your attention, as well as your input and in answering questions, uh, your participation through chat in the classroom. Obviously, you're going to be speaking, raising your hand. Uh, speaking with each other, as well as, um, uh, you know, answering questions from the faculty that they'll ask you. Uh, so I look forward to seeing you in the program. So I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my slides. And we'll open it up to general questions about the program, uh, timing, cost, format, all those sorts of things you might 
uh, want to ask about. We've got about seven minutes. Um, so there you go. Sarah, back Wonderful. to you. Thank you very much, Tim. Uh, thank you. So I will share some slides now. Uh, so we are currently considering applications for the January 2022 intake. Uh, to apply, candidates uh, for the program are required to submit uh, an online application, which includes CV, uh, two uh, essays, two professional references, and degree transcripts uh, showing marks uh, per subject. Currently, uh, it takes our admissions team about one to two weeks uh, to come back with the outcome. And uh, successful applicants have a, a strong academic and professional background with a minimum of uh, five years uh, relevant work experience. Uh, the final deadline to be considered for the 2022 intake is Monday, 6th of December, but we might still be accepting applications after this date if places are available. Okay. So in terms of next steps, if you're interested in having a, a detailed conversation uh, on your candidacy, please request uh, a, vi a video meeting with myself uh, or submit a CV for some initial feedback on your suitability. Uh, alternatively, you can start uh, your application online via our website. Um, you can uh, see here my, my contact details, of course, uh, following this uh, webinar, we will send out the, the recording and, and the slides, so all, all attendees will receive that in a couple of days. Um, reach out to me if you are interested in applying or if you have any, any questions, but, uh, and I will also double check the chat function if there are any more questions. We don't have any questions at the moment, uh, but yeah, please do reach out to me if, if you think of any later on. But uh, thank you uh, very much to Tim Galpin. And Sarah, uh, there, there's actually a couple of questions in the Q&A. Oh, okay. So, you know, um, we can answer those. Yeah, so they're actually, um, Yerbal asks, how do you predict m and digitalization will evolve? So yes, m and starting to get digitized. AI is being used by um, firms that do m and uh, service providers, mainly in the legal uh, documentation review right now, I'm searching for keywords, flagging those. There's still a lot of human element in the due diligence process around legal contracts and review of those during due diligence. But um, there will be more digitization durable as uh, M&A um, or the, as AI evolves um, to try to you know speed up the process, um, make it more streamlined and obviously quicker um, than having the human element involved. Um, we please share the lecture slides. Uh, Lutinadio asks, yes, um, those will be shared. Um, Prashant asks, what's the prescribed time for studying per week? Um, it's in one of the previous slides that Sarah showed. I think it's what, four sure. hours, something like that? Yeah, so we recommend six to eight hours of study time per week. Uh, mainly that will be for, um, for exam or assignment preparation, but also for pre and post readings. Um, mm -hmm. And that workload, those six to eight hours study time, uh, will, will, that commitment will be consistent throughout the duration of the diploma, which is 12 months. Yeah, and you know you will have readings, you will have cases to prepare for each of your modules. You have your assignments after each of the four modules. Um, again, three open book, quote unquote, tests for the first three modules, and then a six thousand word uh, paper slash report um, that is called your final integrative assignment that integrates knowledge across the various modules into this paper uh, analysis that you would do and recommendations. Um, and that's for your final paper after module four. Um, some people, some students dive in and you know, spend a lot more time on it. Others you know, are super busy and they spend less time, but um, you know, it ranges about, as Sarah mentioned, six to eight hours. Um, evaluation based on exams, I just mentioned three open book exams uh, um, uh, that are over the course of a week. So you're not online for two hours you know, taking the exam at the same time, it's an open book. You get, I think, actually, I think a week or two weeks to do it, something like that, yeah. um, and then turn it in. That's for the first three modules. And then the paper, you get two or three months to write your final paper, the 6,000 word assignment after your fourth module. Uh, it is an actual 
assessed degree because uh, it is a degree at Oxford and uh, it, it is a part-time but assessed uh, degree um, that you know, um, is marked and under the exam conventions of the university uh, assessment conventions. So um, there is an exam committee, they you know, oversee the whole assessment process, all that sort of thing. That's Any great. other questions? Uh, no, I think we answered all questions in the Q&A function and I can't see any more in the chat function either. Okay. okay. A wonderful day, evening or morning, middle of the night, wherever you logged in from. Sarah, thank you. Yeah, you too. Thanks, everyone. I look forward to hearing from you shortly. Bye-bye.